Good afternoon and um, hello um, from Notson Library Facebook page on Tuesday the 9th of March and um, thank you for joining me and listening to um, some of the posts that I'm going to be sharing with you um, over the next 20-25 minutes. Today we're celebrating um, everything uh, to do with British Science Week. So we're in the middle of British Science Week, there's all sorts of things happening um, across the country um, and on our Wiltshire Library Facebook pages. Activities for children and author. So today um, I'm going to be showing some science themed poetry. I've got my coffee here, I hope you've got a nice drink. I have a quick drink and um, yeah we're going to be looking at say, a number of um, either um, poems written by people who were more famously known as scientists but also dabbled in poetry and also um, a number of poems um, from uh, about science or science related. So we're going to get started with um, a short poem by Sir Humphrey Davy. Um, he was a first baronet and he lived um, in the late 1700s to the 1800s. He was actually a Cornish chemist and inventor. Um, and of course he was uh, most famously remembered for his Davy lamp, which was a lamp that could be used safely in coal mines. But he also dabbled in poetry and he was friends with um, Robert Southey and also Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And one of his poems that he wrote was called The Nitrous Oxide Experience. Um, and so, yeah, let's get started with our first poem today, The Nitrous Oxide Experience by Sir Humphrey Davy. Not in the ideal dreams of wild desire have I beheld a rapture waken in form. My bosom burns with no unhallowed fire, yet is my cheek with rosy blushes warm. Yet are my eyes with sparkling lustre filled, yet is my mouth replete with murmuring sound. Yet are my limbs with inward transport filled and clad with newborn mightiness around. That's the nitrous oxide experience by Sir Humphrey Davy. Now Davy actually took um, nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas, um, to relieve his toothache. And this is what he had to say about the past. This is a quote now from uh, Sir Humphrey Davy. The power of the immediate operation of a gas in removing intense physical pain I had a very good opportunity of ascertaining. In cutting the unlucky teeth called dentes sapientiae, I experienced an extensive inflammation of the gums accompanied with great pain. On the day when the inflammation was most troublesome, I breathed three large doses of nitrous oxide. The pain always diminished after the first three or four inspirations and the thrilling came on as usual. So that was Humphrey Davy talking about his experience with nitrous oxide, which he also put into a nice poem. Now I'm going to move on now to another um, uh, English physician who um, was called Erasmus Darwin, born in 1731. And of course, he is famously the grandfather of Charles Darwin. Um, but he was, I'd say, an English physician, but he was also a natural philosopher physiologist, slave trade abolitionist, inventor and a poet. Um, and so his poems did include a lot of um, work on natural history. And um, this poem um, I'm going to share with you is one on the linnet's nest. The busy birds with nice selection cull, soft thistle down, grey moss and scattered wool, Far from each prying eye, the nest prepare, foamed of warm moss and lined with softest hair. Week after week, regardless of her food, the incumbent linnet warms her future brood. Each spotted egg with ivory bill she turns, day after day with fond impatience burns. Here's the young prisoner chirping in his cell and breaks in hemispheres, the fragile shell. I don't know what you thought of that poem, but I really quite like that one because it's 
um, it's still very lyrical and it's kind of, um, it's got the nice rhymes and a nice flow to it. Um, but actually it's quite, um, it's got a lot of kind of the, 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 the you know, the um, observations of, of what the linnets does when they're nesting. So that's the kind of the, um, you know, the natural, you know, the natural kind of um, philosopher side of him and um, looking at, um, I say the animal kind of um, actions. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, by Erasmus Darwin, and um, he, uh, one of his regrets that he was known to um, talk about was his regrets that a good education had not been generally available to women in Britain when he was alive, which is rather inappropriate because as well as being British Science Week this week, we're also currently in Women's History Month. And Erasmus Darwin, he was also a slave trade ab abolitionist, but he was also pretty pro the education of women. So um, he was quite an enlightened chap for his for his time. So that was The Linnet's Nest by Erasmus Darwin. So I'm going to move on just do a couple of little short ones now. Um, and I'm taking these from my lovely little book that I love. So this is my poems on nature. And I want to just write a couple of short poems um, that were written by Sarah Teasdale. Uh, she was an American lyric poet, uh, born in 1884, and um, I just like these. Um, the first one is called There Will Come Soft Rains, and then following is February Twilight. Okay, and this is, so this is the first one by Sarah Teasdale, There Will Come Soft Rains. There will come soft rains and the smell of the ground and swallows circling with their shimmering sound and frogs in the pools singing at night and wild plum trees in tremulous white. Robins will wear their feathery fire, whistling their whims on a low fence wire and not one will know of the war, not one will care at last when it is done. Not one would mind, neither bird nor tree, if mankind perished utterly. And spring herself, when she woke at dawn, would scarcely know that we were gone. That was by Sarah Teasdale, There Will Come Soft Rains. And moving on, just another short one by her, it's February Twilight. And I like this one, it's very short, but it's, it's the one who is looking up. Star. So I thought this was appropriate for science, uh, British Science Week. So this is February Twilight. I stood beside a hill, smooth with new laid snow. A single star looked out from the cold evening glow. There was no other creature that saw what I could see. I stood and watched the evening star as long as it watched me. I like that one. Um, you can just imagine, you know, for, for all those astronomers out there, that's a nice one, isn't it? Watching stars and imagining and watching back. So that was by Sarah Teasdale. So I'm going to move on now to a, um, a American poet, essayist and journalist who um, was well known in science circles and he had quite an interest in, 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 with science. Um, and he is, uh, I, uh, you, you may have heard of him, he's called Walt Whitman and he's got this lovely poem called The Cosmos, which I thought was a good one to share with you today. Um, uh, my son is, is uh, very delighted that I'm reading a poem by Walt Whitman having just watched um, all the seasons of Breaking Bad. And of course, if you have seen Breaking Bad, um, you will know that Walt Whitman is, 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 is a key, a kind of a key factor in some of the uh, plot development, shall we say. Um, so here we go. This is Walt Whitman's Cosmos. Who includes diversity and is nature? Who is the amplitude of the earth and the coarseness and sexuality of the earth and the great charity of the earth and the equilibrium also? 
who has not looked forth from the windows, the eyes for nothing, or whose brain held audience with messengers for nothing, who contains believers and disbelievers, who is the most majestic lover, who holds duty his or her triune proportion of realism, spiritualism, and of the aesthetic or intellectual, who having considered the body finds all its organs and parts good, who out of the theory of the earth and of, of, of his or her body understands by subtle analogies all other theories, the theory of a city, a poem, and of the large politics of these states, who believes not only in our globe with its sun and moon, but in other globes with their suns and moons, who constructing the house of himself or herself, not for a day, but for all time, sees races, era, dates, generations, the past, the future, dwelling there like space, inseparable, together. That was Cosmos by Walt Whitman. And um, I'd say he had um, a strong connection with science. He did have some people, some critiques, um, as, as not lots of well-known people do. Um, some people felt he was a little bit too uh, focused on the intuition. And some, some scientists maybe felt that he, you know, um, preferred sticking with a more rigorous and kind of logical kind of aspect. But he felt that they both were needed. And this is a quote from Walt Whitman about, about that. So I'm just going to read this as a quote from Walt Whitman. Exact science and its practical movements are no checks on the greatest poet, but always his encouragement and support. The sailor and traveller, the anatomist, chemist, astronomer, geologist, phrenologist, spiritualist, mathematician, historian and lexicographer are not poets, but they are the lawgivers of poets and their construction underlies the structure of every perfect poem. Another thing, another short quote from Walt Whitman was to be curious, but not judgmental. And I love that. I love that quote. And it's all about working together, isn't it? I think, you know, I can, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think he liked that the, to just, you could see that both of these, both are values, you know, you, you obviously, Good science and rigour is fantastic, but it's good to have maybe um, a little bit of intuition, um, a little bit of poetry as well. And he sums up, that I think is explained in the next poem I'm going to share, because I'm going to do another poem by Walt Whitman now, um, again for all you astronomers. And this is um, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer, and um, see what you think of this poem. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide and measure them, when I sit in heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. That's what Whitman, what I heard of the learned astronomer, and I think as I say, he, he was fascinated by science, but, um, but sometimes he wanted just to appreciate some of the things that they were observing just more of an intuitive, more of a, you know, um, sense. He talks about, doesn't he, the, the mystical, moist night air. And that reminds me, I don't know, I remember a cartoon long ago um, of two cavemen and a cavewoman um, looking at a rainbow. Um, and <laughs> it was uh, the, the, the kind of the one caveman started talking about how rainbows are formed from the um, visible spectrum of light and being refracted in the raindrops and how they're produced from a very scientific kind of optics point of view. Um, whereas the second cave then starts talking about the beauty and the romance of this, this, this um, of the rainbow and more of a poet 
and of course the cable that goes off to the permit. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's obviously there's as worth as 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 um, Walt Whitman would would agree with there's worth in both science and poetry, and actually they they're not mutually exclusive. But that poem does remind me of of, of the uh, the rainbow cartoon that I saw years ago. Now I'm going to move on to another American writer, uh, well known um, poet, editor, and literary critic, and that's Edgar Allan Poe. Um, and he's best known for some of his um, poetry short stories, in particular those of mystery and with a sense of macabre. And some of you might have heard Phil uh, from Salisbury reading The Raven, which was one of his famous poems. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, a bit like Whitman, um, was fascinated with the advances in science and technology. But he was also doubtful of humanity's progress via science alone. And um, he didn't um, want creative intuition to be sacrificed in the name of scientific reasoning. And he believed that truly creative scientific thinking did require an in intuitive imagination as well, that you will get as a poet. So again, it's that kind of idea that, you know, they're both of value and that you, you actually need both disciplines to kind of make the best progress um, in terms of kind of creative thinking. Anyway, he wrote this poem and it's a sonnet to science. Now, obviously, with sonnets you normally associate it with love and things like um, daffodils and, and, and um, skylarks and, and things like that. But he wrote, Edgar Allan Poe wrote this poem, a sonnet, sonnet to science. Science, true daughter of old time thou art, who alterest all things with thy peering eyes. Why prayest thou thus upon the poet's heart? vulture whose wings are dull realities how should he love thee or how deem thee wise who wouldst not leave him in his wandering to seek for treasure in the jewelled skies albeit he soared with an undaunted wing hast thou not dragged diana from her car and driven the hemadryad from the wood to seek a shelter in some happiest star hast thou not torn the naiad from her flood the elfin from the green grass, and from me, the summer dream beneath the tamarind tree. I think that's Edgar Allan Poe take about science, and if, if science is um, followed just in its purest kind of rational sense, and how that maybe leaves a little bit of emptiness, and, and actually you do need both. And I, I would definitely agree with that. And how, how do you feel? I like a little bit of science and a little bit of, po bit of poetry. Moving on now, I'm going to move on now to um, back to an English mathematician and writer. And she was chiefly known for her work on Charles Babbage's proposed mechanical general purpose computer. And of course, it's Ada Lovelace, who was the first person to recognise um, that they could, um, uh, the machine had applications beyond pure calculation. And in fact, she was first to have published the first algorithm and is often regarded as one of the first computer programmers because of this. Now, Ada Lovelace, as you may know, is the daughter of Byron. So she also did have an influence from poetry and she believed passionately in the artistic vein within science. So Ada Lovelace, so she was born in 1815. Sadly, she died only at the age of 36 of uterine cancer. Um, and she wrote this lovely poem um, called The Rainbow. And so I'm just going to share The Rainbow by Ada Lovelace, well-known English mathematician. Bow down in hope, in thanks, all ye who mourn, where in that peerless arc of radiant hues, surpassing earthly tints, the storm subdues. Of nature's strife and tears, tis heaven born to soothe the sad, the sinning and forlorn. A lovely loving token to infuse the hope, the faith that power divine endures. With latent good, the woes by which we're torn. Tis like a sweet repentance of the skies to beckon all by sense of sin oppressed, revealing harmony from tears and sighs, a pledge that deep implanted in the breast, a hidden light may burn that never dies, but burst through clouds in purest hues expressed. That's The Rainbow by Ada Lovelace, and I think that's a lovely poem. Um, and it talks about, doesn't it, 
um, it makes me feel that, that sense of hope that a rainbow is. So, you know, you might have had rain, but the rain, then the rainbow might appear. And, you know, the rainbow appears because the sun starts shining as well at the same time as the rain. And of course, we have the light being refracted in the raindrops. And you get this beautiful, beautiful rainbow. And again, it's that hope that, isn't it, behind every rain cloud, there is the sun still shining. And of course, in, in the Old Testament of the, of the Bible, um, after the, the flood, uh, the story of the flood, of course, the rainbow appears again. And that's also seen as a promise uh, of better things. Um, so there is that kind of hope attached to a rainbow, isn't there? Um, and apart from anything else, it just looks beautiful. Um, but it's fascinating as well, isn't it? And um, if you've ever seen a double rainbow, and of course, the science behind that is when within the raindrop, the, the light is it, rather than just being refracted straight through, it kind of goes and it's reflected back on itself and then reflected back again. So it does kind of like almost like a Z shape. And that's what creates a double rainbow. And I think you even get triple rainbows um, where it kind of does a bit of a double kind of thing inside the raindrop and continues on. And that's what you get at the triple rainbow. And I once was fortunate enough to see a triple rainbow. Um, it was amazing. It was so faint. The third rainbow was incredibly faint, but it was very special to see. Wow, look, there it is. There is that triple rainbow. So, well, wow, it's already uh, 25 past three. So I am going to finish, though, just very quickly. Uh, this one for all the natural naturalists out there. Um, so, yes, for naturalists, zoologists and biologists across the world, I'm going to finish with a, rather f a funny poem from my book, Comic Poems. It's nice to finish with a, a little bit of like, something a little bit more lighthearted. And I'm going to read you a book by, uh, a poem by Hilaire Belloc. And this is called The Frog. So as I say, this is for all the naturalists, zoologists and, and uh, biologists out there. The Frog by Hilaire Belloc. Be kind and tender to the frog and do not call him names. A slimy skin or pollywog or likewise ugly James or Gapagrin, or Toad Gone Wrong, or Billy Bandy's Knees. The frog is justly sensitive to epithets like these. No animal will more repay a treatment kind and fair. At least so lonely people say, who keep a frog, and by the way, they are extremely rare. That's the frog by Hilaire Bullock to finish with on today's tea and poetry. I hope you've enjoyed some of the poems and some of the information about um, some of the scientists that we have and also some of the po poets who were fascinated by science, particularly in the, Victor in, the uh, in the 1800s. So, and as I say, I think just to sum up some of the poems, I think, you know, science is a wonderful thing. We get so much from science and technology. Um, I'm talking to you now live through Facebook because of the technology. Um, um, but it's also important to have that sense of beauty and poetry in the world as well to help with our imaginations and our creativity. So um, both are equally valued. <laughs> I hope you agree. Maybe you don't. Comment if, you did, if you've got any other feelings or thoughts on that. But in the meantime, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Back to my coffee now and take care and see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.